Welcome to Hannity, and tonight we are in beautiful Clive, Iowa, right outside of Des Moines. We have a massive, incredible, enthusiastic audience tonight. And in a few short moments, well, the very first 2024 presidential caucus will take place right here in Iowa, unlike the Democratic Party. But uh, in just a moment, the leading presidential candidate for the Republicans, Donald J. Trump, will be with us for the full hour. By the way, unlike fake news CNN, it's not my job to sit here and debate the candidate. We're going to ask him about the issues of the day that actually matter to the people that came out here tonight in the, in the rain and thunder and lightning, the voters, and they will also have their questions as well. Nothing is off the table. And as of now, Trump is not only beating his Republican rivals, but he's also beating President Biden. Real clear politics average. Trump is up. In a head-to-head -head matchup there in the most recent Harvard-Harris poll has him up by seven points over Joe Biden. The vast majority of Americans, including Democrats, they're not happy with Joe Biden. I don't think many Americans are happy with Joe Biden, to say the least. And based on recent polls, voters believe that Biden is corrupt, incompetent, creepy, both mentally, physically, cognitively unfit to serve. By the way, today was no exception. At the Air Force Academy, Biden could not remember the word pilot or fighter pilot. Take a look. By the way, I met with the, who are those guys that fly over shortly? You heard of them, haven't you? Three of them are women. <laughs> so don't screw around, guys. Don't screw around, guys. <laughs> All right, got much worse from there. And by the way, viewer warning, this is kind of hard to watch. But following those remarks, well, Biden fell flat on his face and took another tumble and fall. Take a look. for joining us today. Now, we all hope the president is okay, but there needs to be a serious discussion in this country about his physical fitness, his mental acumen, his ability to serve. The presidency is the toughest job on earth. It requires, well, a tough, capable leader. And you might recall 2024, and we talked about this in past election years, the American people, they will now have a critical opportunity to right the ship that begins right here in the great state of Iowa. Let's give a warm <laughs> Iowa welcome. Joining us now for the hour, the 45th president of the United States, current GOP presidential candidate, frontrunner Donald Trump. They all came out. It was raining cats yeah. and dogs today. It was a little nasty out, but it's Iowa. It's a beautiful place. When it rains, it's beautiful. Uh, we've been, uh, we've really been loved in Iowa, and I love Iowa. We won both times by a lot. Yeah. So we're very happy. We're very happy. You're up in the polls here. I, I want to start with the current president. Um, did you see the video of when he fell? Yeah. And, and did you see the video? He actually said... Uh, by the way, I met with, um, who are those guys that are going to fly over shortly? Yeah. Yeah, that's your president uh, right not, now. Not too good. It's sad. It's sad. It's not, you know, it's, uh, they're representing, we are all representing the country. You become president and uh, you're sort of not allowed to do that, but it's happened. It's happened and it's happened pretty badly. Uh, we won't go into it, but we all know the ones and they... Uh, they count those acts, you know, they never forget. But that was a bad fall. 
You know, I remember they made, remember the media made so much. You, I think you were at West Point at the time. Yeah. And you were coming down a ramp. Yeah. It didn't have a rail. You had dress shoes on like you have now, yeah. which have very slippery it's soles. Correct. They look a little better, but you better not uh, walk in rain. That's true. <laughs> yes, especially downhill on a ramp. Um, you know, it was very interesting. I think I made my best speech. And that was my best speech. And I was so proud of it. It was pouring. It was pouring. And... I said, this speech was so good. And then I said, how do I get down? Sir, you have to go down the ramp. I said, the same one I came up, it was a long, like an ice skating rink. And they said, yes, sir. And I had the general next to me, the commandant of cadets, nice guy, big guy, strong guy. I said, general, uh, and he's wearing combat boots. They don't slip too much. I said, general, get ready, because I may have to grab you here. But I said, I'm not falling. There's no way. So I'd go tippy-toe down the thing. <laughs> that was a mistake because it didn't look so good. I even agree it was. But I got killed, and they never covered that speech. I said, it was my best. Someday, they'll, in 100 years, they're going to put that speech on. I, I really, but uh, you can't fall. You just can't fall, no matter what. Just can't allow it to happen. And I better not allow, especially after saying this, I better not allow it to happen with me. <laughs> but things like that do happen. So in past interviews that we've had together, and we've had many over the years, yeah. I have asked you repeatedly about what you think about Joe Biden's cognitive state. I've asked you about, is he up to the job physically, mentally? You have been very reluctant to go there. Um, I'm not reluctant. To me, I've, does I've everyone agree that. with me that this guy's cognitively not there? I doubt he knows what day of the week it is today. That's how, that's how bad I think it's gotten for him. Why are you reluctant to call that out? Well, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this. I actually called Sean, and I, I asked Sean not to joke about it. I was joking Because he used it. to joke about it. And I said, honestly, I don't think it looks good for you or for anybody for you to joke about it, because it's a serious problem. I was talking about sippy cup and warm milky at night and yeah. bed, bedtime stories. Yeah. So I said, uh, I just don't think it's good for anybody, and, you know, it's uh, not appropriate. You can speak about it if you want, but you, I don't think you should joke about it. And you really didn't after that. Well, now I realize how serious it is. I mean, especially, and we'll get into foreign policy, and, you know, with China, Russia, and Iran forming, I'm calling it a new axis of evil. Yeah. I'm very, very concerned that he's abdicated our role on the world stage. Let me, let me start. I do say this. I think it's the most serious time and the most dangerous time right now in the history of our country. We have nuclear weapons on lots of different areas. Uh, we have Russia. We have North Korea. We have Iran is going to soon have one. That should have never happened. I had that set up. We would have made that deal within a week after the election, and they would have never had a nuclear weapon. But nobody picked it up because I terminated the Iran nuclear deal. But this is the most dangerous time in the history of our country because of the power of the weaponry. And we have somebody that doesn't understand what's happening. And it's a very dangerous thing. It's a very bad thing. Uh, I mean, some really bad things. If you would see, and I got to see it, if you would see the power of what we're talking about, this is an army tanks going back and forth shooting at each other. This is something that's a whole different place. This is annihilation of the world, literally. The power is so, so horrible. And uh, I was actually working on something with Putin where we start getting rid of nuclear weapons. It's just too powerful. And, you know, all of a sudden, people are talking about nuclear weapons all the time. I wouldn't let people talk about it. I had somebody come down from MIT. I was talking about that. My uncle was a, a great professor for many years at MIT. And I had somebody come down. And I said, what would you say, like, during the debate about nuclear weapons? He looked at me and said, sir, don't talk about them. I said, why? He said, there's nothing you can say. It's so powerful. It's so extraordinary. The best thing you can do is not talk about them. Now they're talking about them all the time. That's all they talk about. Uh, in fact, I guess Putin announced the other day he's moving nuclear weapons to Belarus. So this is a very dangerous time for our country, but it's a very dangerous time for the whole world. You end your rally speeches now with music in the background, and you start with, we are a nation in decline. And this is a very different America than what it was when you left it as president two and a half years ago. Yeah. And I can point to the border. I can look at laws all over the country, uh, defund, dismantle, no bail laws. Uh, we've given up energy independence. We're importing oil from Venezuela yeah. and, and OPEC. And right, who would have believed that? 
And we now see two thirds of our country are living paycheck to paycheck. You see some people not cashing in their retirement just so they can make ends meet. Others are putting, you know, bare necessities on credit cards. I'll mention this in Iowa because I, I have, you know, a radio show with 720 stations. Farmers call me. The cost of fertilizer is three times what it used to be. The cost of seed is twice what it used to be. And if you can get the parts to repair your equipment, you know, it's four times what it used to be. How, you know, how is, I've never seen it this bad or this de decline this precipitously. So we were energy independent. Think of it three years ago. And, and what people... What people don't know is that we have, I call it liquid gold, because it's gold, it's better than gold. We have liquid gold under our feet more than any other nation, more than Saudi Arabia, more than Russia. We're energy independent. Within six months, we would have been energy dominant. And we were going to sell energy to Europe and lots of other places. And we were going to make so much money doing it because it's such a big world. You know, it's such a big business. It's all encompassing. And that's what started the inflation. I mean, the energy, we stopped drilling and all of a sudden uh, gasoline's going up to five, six dollars a gallon in a car for a car and just horrible things were happening. And it, it happened. But way, we were going to pay off debt. We were going to reduce taxes further. We gave you the biggest tax cut in the history of our country, bigger than the Ronald Reagan tax cut. And the biggest. And, you know, I think more importantly, Sean, we gave you the biggest regulation cuts. That's why we had more jobs than we ever had before. We've never had anything close. And we did all of that. And then to end that, but we were going to pay off debt. We were going to get the debt because the money is so big. It's so massive. You look at Saudi Arabia, the money they have, no nation's ever had anything like it. And we have more than they have. We were going to pay off debt. We were going to get the energy prices down. We we're going to get interest rates down. It, it was like we had something going that, and within six months, we would have been dominant because we would have taken over Europe. We would have literally been supplying the energy to Europe. And we would have made a fortune. We would have paid down the debt. We would have cut the taxes. It was going to be so beautiful. Let, let me focus on the issues that I think bread and butter issues that impact everybody. I want to know if you get elected president, how fast you're going to be able to fix our borders, bring us back to energy independence, how quickly you might be able to work to change the school system, bring back law and order and safety and security to this country and every town and every city, because I think people need that if they want to pursue happiness. How yeah. quickly can you can you shift gears and move this country? Okay. I think very quickly. Let, let me just say, so I heard De Sanctis saying, oh, well, I get eight years, I get eight years, he gets four. You don't need four and you don't need eight. You need six months. Within six months, I said, <laughs> within six months, this can be done. Other than, other than... You don't need eight years. And frankly, I wouldn't vote for him because he said, you need eight years. You need six months. We're going to drill. We're going to get our energy down. When the energy comes down, other things come down. And we're going to take care of things. We're going to immediately close up the border. We had the, we had the greatest border. We had the safest border in the history of our country. Now we have the worst border in the history of the world. There's no... And I say this during rallies. We love our rallies. But I say it during... There's never been a third world country that allowed people to pour into a country. They'd stand there with sticks and stones if they had to. What's happening to our country, but in terms of doing it, you don't need eight years and you don't need four years. We can have a lot of it done because these guys are amazing. The old guys, they will be... In fact, I had it so low that we had to raise it or they would have all been out of business. We had so much oil, we didn't know what to do with it. We bought a lot of it for very little for the strategic national reserves that he then took to keep the prices down before an election. You know, we had the strategic national reserves almost full. And then Biden came along and took it to keep prices down. It's called artificially down. And the thing is almost empty now. And that's meant for times of war. It's not meant to keep a price down for an automobile. It's meant for war, for real problems. And we had it 75, think of it, 75 million barrels. And I bought it for peanuts and Congress I had to fight Congress, and the pricing was so crazy and so good. And we needed a place because we had so much. So we started filling up. This guy comes along, and he takes it for automobiles, for people so they, before the election, so the price could keep down. Now it's totally empty. It's, it's the emptiest I think it's been in 50 years. Down 48%. And it's so sad. And by the way, the price is still very high. 
I don't think gas went over three dollars a gallon, if I'm not mistaken, when you were when you were president as an average. We had it down to a dollar eighty seven. We actually had a little period of time where we we had it we had it lower than that. So but the energy companies were the oil companies weren't gonna last. We had to say I had said, wait a minute, I love it in one way, but in another way, uh, they're all gonna go bust. We gotta get it up a little bit. But we had it down to a dollar eighty seven, but we had a, a period of time where it was much lower than that. It was too low, actually. So we have, we, we have. Rec- That's a good problem, by the way. That's a much better problem than it's at six dollars and seven and eight and nine. All right. So we have this new. I call it a new axis of evil. Yeah. You have China aligned with Russia, aligned with Iran. Let's yeah. start with China. Um, here you have a Chinese spy balloon. There are no consequences. Here you have just this week a Chinese simulator that takes out all of our war- warships in the Pacific and the China Sea. Very sophisticated. Um, you have a confrontation with a fighter jet of China with our fighter jet. They come what within 400 feet or whatever it was. Um, our de- Joe Biden's defense secretary wants to meet with their defense secretary, and they basically give Joe Biden the middle finger and say no. And you see that there's a, a growing Cold War with China, who's aligned with two other hostile regimes. And I got to believe that's not a good situation for America right now, because, you know, Putin seems to have no qualms about taking down a drone out of the sky. No consequences for him, no consequences for China. What would you what would you do? So we had a great thing with China and until COVID came in then I didn't even want to deal with them. But I had a great relationship with President Xi. But I was charging them tariffs, and if I didn't do because they were dumping steel like nobody's ever seen anything like it before, destroying our steel mills and our steel plants. And I put on a 50% tariff, and all of a sudden our steel industry was doing good. I did it for washing machines. I did it for dryers. I did it for a lot of things because they were destroying a lot of our businesses. But we were taking in hundreds of billions of dollars. And we're in Iowa. I gave the farmers $28 billion. You know that. $28 billion. And in one of my moments, I said, there's no way I lose Iowa. I gave the farmers $28 billion from China. I took $28 billion. I asked Sonny Perdue, who was the uh, secretary of of, uh, agriculture, and a very good guy said, Sonny, how badly have our farmers been hurt by what China was doing? They were killing our farmers, right? Just killing them. He said about $28 billion. I said, that's okay. And... I had $28 billion worth of checks written out to all of the farmers of our country. And I said, there's no way I'm going to lose this, uh, this state. And there's no way I'm losing Nebraska and some other ones. But uh, I've had more people thanking me for that. But think of it. I took $28 billion from China and gave it to our farmers. Nobody else would do that. Nobody else. Vladimir Putin. You have said repeatedly in interviews that if you were president, he never would have went into Ukraine. How do you say that? And then you also have said that if you're president, you can end this very quickly. Yeah. I say how if I'm president, and by the way, this is a much worse position than before it started. Before it started, it was easy. He wasn't going to do it. And I had conversations and it was always the apple of his eye. I mean, I could see that. But I said, you're not going to do it. And if you do it, we're going to have problems like you've never had before. He understood. I said things. He said, you don't mean that. I said, I mean it 100 percent. And he didn't totally believe me, but he believed me 10 percent. And that's all he had to do. He he knew that there well, was going to be a problem. Can I just say, and President wait, wait, Xi, you're, 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 you're implying something here. You basically said I'd obliterate you. Is that what you said? I though? said things that were very bad, very nasty. <laughs> and kind of, kind of like what? <laughs> and, you know, honestly, I got I got along. And he said, you don't mean that. It had to do with Moscow. I said, he said. You don't mean that. I said, I do. I'll never talk about it again, but I do. He said, you don't mean it. You don't mean it. And we then went on to other subjects. But I don't think he believed me, but he believed me 10 percent. That's all he had to believe me. Five percent would be good enough. But I had the same conversation with President Xi about Taiwan, President Xi of China. I said, "Uh, President, don't do it with Taiwan. Don't even think about doing it with Taiwan. He was never going to do it. And now he's circling, circling. Ships are circling. Planes are flying over the top. 28 bombers last week went over the right over the middle of it. And a lot of stuff going on. And a lot of this has to do also with the fact that we were so incompetent in the way we left Afghanistan. It was so I think it was the most 
It was the most embarrassing and most incompetent moment in the history of our country. And I think both of them looked at that and they said, wow, this is not the same country that we know. We rebuilt our military. I rebuilt the military. New jets, new everything. We had everything. And they gave away $85 billion worth of the best equipment in the world. Nobody can even believe it. The, the biggest, I mean, they're the biggest seller of equipment. They're the biggest right after us. Afghanistan. Can you imagine? Afghanistan is one of the biggest arms merchants in the world because they don't need 700,000 guns and rifles, 70,000 armor-plated trucks and trucks and different things, but millions of dollars for some of them. 700,000 arms. Think of it, rifles. 70,000 trucks. There's not a used car lot in all of Iowa or in all of the country probably that has more than 500. These people had 70,000, and some of these are, you know, a big, heavy, armor-plated stuff for the roadside bombs. Uh, Soleimani, you know, Soleimani was not good. Uh, that situation was taken care of. And al-Baghdadi was not good, and that situation was taken care of. But we did a lot. You know, our military is great. A lot of things going on with our military, with the woke and all this nonsense. They're not, they're not learning to fight and protect us from some very bad people. They want to go woke. They want to go woke. That's all they talk about now. I see letters that are being sent. It's horrible. I mean, it's really a, a serious problem. That would end immediately. But when you look at what we did, right. we, we, rebuilt, we rebuilt our military. We added Space Force. Everyone said, oh, Space Force, what is that all about? When they came in, Biden wanted to end it. He said, what is this, a game? It's going to turn out to be one of the most important. It hasn't happened since Air Force 78 years ago. And it's unbelievable now. China and Russia were taking over space. And now we're leading in space because Please. of Space Force. It was a very important move. We've got to take a break. More with former President Donald Trump. We'll ask him about the growing GOP field, the weaponization of our justice system, and so much more. We are in beautiful Clive, Iowa, outside of Des Moines. Thank you for being with us for Town Hall and questions from the audience. Straight ahead. This is a Fox News alert. I'm Chad Pergram on Capitol Hill. The Senate is poised tonight to align with the House and approve a bipartisan deal to suspend the debt ceiling through 2025. It's an accord negotiated by President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. The plan also reduces some forms of federal spending. The Senate needs 60 yeas to approve the plan. A coalition of senators from both parties are expected to lend their support to the bill later tonight. The measure then goes to the president to sign. This comes just before the federal government was scheduled to run out of cash on Monday. That's because the government would lack authority to borrow more. Lawmakers worried about a potential market shock had Congress failed to act. This is the first big debt ceiling debate since 2011. This is a Fox News alert. I'm Chad Pergram on Capitol Hill. Now back to Hannity. All right, we are back with Donald J. Trump. We're outside of beautiful Des Moines, Iowa for the hour. We will be taking questions from the audience. And tonight, as the 2024 race heats up, President Trump and other Republican candidates are now crisscrossing the state. And, of course, the former president has a commanding lead in both Iowa and nationally. The GOP field, though, is growing. Last week, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis threw his hat in the ring, and soon we expect that... Uh, Former Vice President Mike Pence will be in. Uh, Anti-Trump zealot Chris Christie will join in. And, but and can anyone close the gap? Let's talk about, what, I guess we're up to nine people after next week. Um, That's a good thing, isn't it? I think pretty good. But I, I don't think it matters. Uh, I, I don't know why people are doing it. They're at 1 percent. Some are at zero. I hear Chris Christie's coming in. He, he's at... He was at he was at six percent in New Jersey, which is I love New Jersey, but six percent approval rating in New Jersey. What's the purpose? And he's he's polling at zero, and uh, others are uh, I call him Ada Hutchinson. I don't call him Asa. I call him Ada Hutchinson. I gave him a little name for some reason, for certain reasons. But this guy, nobody knows who the hell he is. Never, never good. 
And some, uh, you know, it's fine, but I don't understand what they're doing. Now, maybe there's something wrong, but when you're at 1% or less, you know, 1%, it says 1% with an arrow pointing left. There's one guy who's at zero with an arrow pointing left. That means he's at less than zero. So uh, it is what it is. You know, I, I really go after the one who's second. And I think the one who's second is going down so much and so rapidly that I don't think he's going to be second that much longer. I think he's going to be third or fourth. He had a very bad day today. He got very angry at the press. You're not allowed to get angry at the press. Let me, let me... At the fake news, he got angry. So you probably became in history the most investigated president of all time. Times 10. Okay. So... But if my poll numbers went down, it would all end. You know, every time my poll goes up, I say, oh, this is a problem. But we had a poll today that showed I was... 44 points above number two and beating Biden and beating Biden by 11 points, beating Biden by 11 points and beating Biden by 15 and 16 points in some of them. And he's not doing well against Biden. Let me let me ask you, because you are because we can't take a chance of this election. I think a lot of people agree with that. I don't I don't think things have been as bad turned so badly so quickly. The third issue is there's a special counsel that's appointed and news broke yesterday that there might be a tape recording that, quote, where you acknowledge that you understood yeah. that these were classified documents. Do you, first of all, do you know who this call may be with? Do you know anything no, about it? No, I don't know anything about it. All I know is this. Everything I did was right. We have the Presidential Records Act, which I abided by 100 percent. Biden has 1,850 boxes with a lot of classified stuff that he's not supposed to have in his case. I have the right to declassify as president. He's got 1,850 boxes that he doesn't want anyone to see. He had seven or eight boxes in Chinatown in Washington, D.C., where nobody even speaks English in Chinatown. Chinatown is very, it's, it's in favor of China. And he has boxes in Chinatown. They took those boxes and they sent them to Boston to his lawyer so his lawyer could look through them and probably do things that you're not supposed to do. No, this is about election interference. And in fact, I have to tell you, uh, Dershowitz and, and a couple of very good guys wrote an article today. Uh, the Tobacco King, you know who the Tobacco King, he did a great job on the tobacco companies. They wrote an article today that this is a disgrace that they're even looking at this stuff. There was nothing done wrong, nothing whatsoever. Now, look at the boxes with Biden, where they're in his garage. They're all over the floor. They're sitting under his Corvette with the grease and everything else on a garage door that you could cut with a scissor and no Secret Service. I have Secret Service all over the place. Mar-a-Lago is a fort. It's literally, you know, she built that as a Southern White House. But when you look at it, and it's another... Uh, it's a continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. It's a hoax. And it has to do... It has to do more than anything else with trying to interfere with the election. And let me tell you, DOJ actually took... You talk about Bragg, the DA of New York. I never thought I'd be dealing with a guy like this. You talk about Bragg. The DOJ in Washington put his top guy into the DA's office, which is local, which is city state. But they put the top guy in the Justice Department into that office to make sure Trump gets in trouble. Can you believe it? It's never, ever happened before. And then Hillary Clinton's lawyer from, I guess it's Paul Weiss, left Paul Weiss to work in the prosecutor's office because he hates Trump and he wants to get Trump. And then nobody wanted to do anything because they say, you know, Trump didn't do anything wrong, including Bragg originally said Trump didn't do anything wrong. And then he prosecutes for, you for what, what he said was not wrong. But they uh, took this me, guy, yeah, they fine. took this guy and they put him in there and he left the firm and he went in. It's a big, uh, you know, uh, Pomerantz, Mark Pomerantz. And he left to become a prosecutor. He was a Democrat lawyer and now he's trying to prosecute me. And then what happened is they wouldn't do what he wanted to do because it was too bad even for them. So this guy left and he writes a book during the process. They tell me what he did is criminal. They tell me. Now, let's see what happens. But he's in a lot of trouble. So here's a prosecutor left and he wrote a book during a prosecution. But I've been going through this for seven years. Russia, 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 all of it. The Mueller report, which was no collusion. After two and a half years, there was no collusion with Russia 
I was the worst thing. Putin would say, you know, they say you like me. He said, you are the worst guy that we've ever had to deal with. I'm the one that stopped the uh, pipeline, the, uh, the big uh, pipeline going up to Germany. I stopped it. When Biden came in, it's called Nord Stream 2. When Nord Stream 2, nobody ever heard of it until I came along. I said, you're allowing Russia to build a pipeline through Europe? I stopped it. It was stopped dead. And then the election came about, and Biden came in. One of the first things he did was allow Russia to complete the pipeline. I had it stopped. And then they say, I'll tell you what, they're a party of disinformation. They'll say, Trump is soft on Russia. I, I'm the hardest on Russia that there's ever been. The sanctions we did, everything else. And I got along with Putin. Let me, let me follow up. And by the way, the hardest on China by a factor. I took in hundreds of billions of dollars from China. And as I said, no other president ever took in 10 cents. And you know what? China respected us. And President Xi respected your president. And he didn't want to have any more tariffs. And he didn't want to have any more sanctions. But he respected us. And now he doesn't respect. They don't even return phone calls. You know, abortion now is back as a real campaign issue. Yeah. Um, and then issues I didn't think when I started my radio career in 1987, I'd be talking a lot about, but uh, education, kids, gender identity classes, yeah, yeah. CRT. Uh, I'd never thought we'd really have this deep debate about whether or not biological men could be playing in women's sports. Yeah. When so, you, so crazy. On all of these issues, you know, what is the best way that you see to settle? Well, I did something that nobody thought was possible. I got rid of Roe v. Wade. And by doing that, by doing that, it put pro-lifers in a very strong negotiating position. Now they're negotiating different things. And, you know, I happen to be of the Ronald Reagan school in terms of uh, exemptions where you have the life of the mother, right. rape, and rape, incest. incest, mother's life. So right. you have that. And I think, you know, for me, that's something that works very well. And for probably 80, 85 percent, because don't forget, we do have to win elections. But I did something that nobody could do. And I also made them the radicals because they are willing and able to kill babies in the ninth month. They're willing to kill babies. That's radical. Pro-life isn't radical. They've made pro-life radical, the other side. Pro-life is not radical. What's radical is killing a baby in the eighth month, the seventh month, the ninth month, or even the babies after the baby's born. And, and, you know, unfortunately, we have a lot of politicians, and you saw that in the midterms. I think it was a big factor that didn't really know how to talk about what we did with Roe v. Wade and what we did on pro-life. They didn't know how to talk about it. And it energized the Democrats, and they used that. I mean, they used that as a commercial. You wouldn't believe it. Well, what, but, what should the But Republican especially when you didn't be? have the exceptions. When you didn't have the exceptions, they went after the people, like, viciously, the ads. And those people did not, generally speaking, they didn't do very well in terms of election. But when, when you have the exceptions and you go through the whole, the whole gamut, it's something that's an incredible thing. But one thing it really did, though, Sean, is it gave people that are pro-life a great power to negotiate. We had no power to negotiate because you had Ray, Roe v. Wade sitting in there where you could do anything, where the other side could do anything. They can't do that right now. So we're in a great position to negotiate something really, really good. And most people, I think, really respect what we did. Now, I will say, every once in a while, I watch somebody say, I did more for uh, abortion on abortion and abortion rights and pro-life. I did more than Trump. Well, only stupid people would say that, because everyone said there was no way that Roe v. Wade was going to disappear. But because because it was very unfair. The other thing is people wanted to bring it back to the states. I consider that less important. but. Nevertheless, a lot of people want to bring it back. This brings it back to the States. More with Donald Trump, and we'll hear from our Iowa audi audience as we continue from the great state of Iowa. Thank you. Please stay with us. All right, welcome back to Hannity. Hello, Iowa. Thank you for being here. Now, according to a recent Harvard-Harris poll, the majority of Americans now believe, quote, Joe Biden was involved with his son, uh, in what is an illegal influence peddling scheme, and yet 
As far as we know, despite a mountain of evidence, now the FBI had Hunter's laptop since December of 2019. The FBI and the DOJ, they refused to investigate, quote, the big guy uh, who Hunter complained he had to give half his income to. And on the other hand, there is no shortage of witch hunts against Donald Trump, which we were talking about a little bit in the last segment. Now, the 45th president of the United States is back with us for reaction to all of that. This goes to the heart of Jim Jordan's investigation. Is the FBI politicized? Is the DOJ weaponized? James Comer's committee looking into whether or not the Biden family, uh, in fact, we, we, we know that Joe lied when he said in a debate with you and, and said it to other press people, when he said, there, there's, I've never talked to my son about his foreign business dealings. We've got photographic evidence. We have dates and times of meetings. We now have, according to James Comer, routing uh, plans to different LLCs, and money's going to nine separate Biden family members. And they're looking for one particular document where $5 million was exchanged for an act that they claim that Joe Biden may have committed in exchange for this deal. Um, yet how come nothing happens to them? Well, they're being protected, and it's a uh, one-sided system. It's a very unfair system, but they're being protected. Look at the time that Biden said about the billion dollars to get rid of the prosecutor. Now, if can you imagine if I said that? A billion dollars to get rid of the prosecutor? You talk about tape. That's on tape. That's so illegal, what he said. It's America's money. We're not going to give you a billion dollars unless you get rid of the prosecutor that was prosecuting his son and his son's company, even though his son didn't know anything about energy or anything else. And he's on the board of an energy company getting paid a fortune, by the way. No, the whole thing is crazy what's going on. And it's so bad because it makes them look so bad. You know, we talk about borders. We talk about elections. But you can add the the uh, our justice system. If it's corrupt, if the people think, if there's any perception of being corrupt, and when you look at all of this criminality, like the laptop has so much stuff on it, it's so bad, it's so evil, and yet they don't want to do anything. It even affected the impeachment, because impeachment hoax number one and two, if they read the laptop and they had the laptop, should not have proceeded, because I was right. And it should not have proceeded. A lot of people said that. But... It is a dual uh, system of, of uh, government. There's a dual system of... Uh, you talk about law and order. You can't have law and order in a country where you have such corruption. And the corruption is... And they fight so hard not to give the papers. Yeah. With me, they make up papers. They fight so hard not to give a document. Now, how bad can this document be? And it's very dangerous. I think it's a third point, but it's very dangerous for our country. Well, Comer said to me on radio today, he has the document. He said it on TV last night. Let me hey, ask by the way, he's doing a great job, and Jim Jordan, are doing, they're doing a fantastic job. Let, let me ask you one question. I've asked you this question before, and it comes up a lot. People know that I, I've interviewed you all these years. I've, I've known you almost 30 years. And people ask me and, and say to him, why does he have to fight so hard? Why doesn't he pick his fights a little more? Why does he have to call people names? And the only reason I think this is an important question is because these, I think everyone here tonight is likely voting for you, right? So, <laughs> however, so. it's going to come down to those people that maybe are in the middle a little more, and the argument that they make to me is, if he would just tone it down a hair, stop a little of the name calling. Oh, Hang on. I said it's their question. Leave me alone. All right. Um, that that it might help you with swing voters in, in that are needed for you to get over the finish line. It's already hard enough electoral vote wise for a Republican to win. What do you say to them? OK, you ready? And I say this to everybody. I won an election that was unprecedented. We beat somebody that supposedly had it made, and, you know, they probably did things in that election, too. They were shocked. But I came into office, and from the day I got in, I was under siege by people that have been in Washington for many years, put in there by many different presidents, in most cases, people that were against me. Like, they spied on my campaign. They did all sorts of things. I was under investigation and under siege, and so were my people. And if I wasn't tough, I wouldn't be here right now, I guarantee you that. If I didn't fight back, I wouldn't be here. What they did is so bad, and they've been caught. Now, so far, nothing's happened to them of consequence. We had 
and Attorney General Bill Barr, who didn't have the courage to fight. He just didn't have the courage. He was a nice man, but he didn't have the courage. He lost his courage when they wanted to impeach him. They said, we're going to impeach Bill Barr. They didn't even know why. There was no reason to impeach him. He didn't do anything wrong. But he didn't have the courage. We need courage in this country, or we're going to lose our country. All right, I'll tell you what. You can stand up if you want, or sit down, whatever you prefer. Hi, sir, what's your name? Mike Etheridge. All right, Mike, is it? Mike. Hi, Mike. Uh, you have a question for President Trump. I, I like do. That, by the way, I, I think I'm going to like this question. Look at that. I, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> Thank you. He's making money off your name, just so I'm, you know. Okay, I'm going to. We're well, not somebody gonna is. I'm not going to sue him. <laughs> uh, my question is, from the time that you left office uh, until now, and in fact, in my case, it happened very quickly. Um, I am a veteran. I use the VA. I was getting in to see a doctor two, three weeks. Yeah. From the time you left, and this is within a month, the next time was eight months. Yeah, I know. They, they let the system break. Are you talking about the VA? I am. Um, so we had a 92% approval rating. No, nobody's ever come close. I think the highest was 51, and it was many years ago. We had a 92% with the VA. And I did two things that were really, we had great people at the top. We had a lot of great people. You know, we talk about the bad ones, but we had a lot of great people. And they did a fantastic job when you get a 92% rating. And I really appreciate that you say it. What happened with the VA is they had a lot of very bad people in the VA sadists, very sick people that were really, they were beating up and hurting our people. And you couldn't do anything about it. And I got through Congress an act where we can... Fire those people. We got rid of 7,000 really bad people. But the other thing of equal importance, maybe more important, if you had to wait, like you said, you had to wait, under my system, you, if you had to wait more than a day, as you know, you would go to a private hospital or you would go to a private doctor and they would take care of you. And people weren't dying. You know, people were dying waiting online. They were waiting for six months. They became terminally ill for something where a simple procedure or a simple prescription could have taken care of it. And if they had to wait for more than 24 hours, I gave them the right to go to a private doctor. We paid the bill. We negotiated with them. We had certain set prices because otherwise, you know, it wouldn't be good. And we had the highest rating. That's why the veterans love Trump. We did a great job. It's so nice that you say it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. All right. I understand. Sir, what's your name? Uh, my name's Tony, retired USAF Lieutenant Colonel, volunteer for a number of senior organizations Great. Uh, well, to include AARP, full, dis yeah. full disclosure. Great. Um, high inflation. We have a, a Medicare system that is severely lacking funding, running out of funding. Right. We have a trust fund in Social Security that's going broke. Yeah. Across Iowa, serious concerns for seniors. What's your envision? What can you do? How can we solve these problems and get them done? So inflation is a killer of countries. If you look back 200 years, you could look back to empires where inflation came. The empires all dissolved. They were all gone. Inflation is uh, it's a cancer to a country. We are going to stop inflation. We still have way high inflation, the highest in 52 years. And they're saying, oh, we're doing better because it's down to 5 percent. 5 percent is a lot. But we were heading up and we could head up right now with what's going on. We could head up very, very much higher. But we're going to drill. We're going to bring energy way down. When energy comes down, other things are coming. That's what caused the inflation in the first place. We're going to bring energy down. We're going to then bring interest rates down because interest rates, people can't buy homes. They can't borrow money. They can't do anything now. I mean, our economy, right now, our economy is a total mess and we'll stop it. And when we stop inflation and when we get interest rates down and when we do all of the things that we have to do, including, again, I rebuilt our military, but we have to rebuild it again. You know, our military has no ammunition. We have no ammunition. We've given much of it, almost all of it, but we've given much of it to Ukraine. And we want to help people, but I want to stop the war. I don't want that war to continue. And I'll stop that war, mark my words, I'll stop that war in 24 hours, but we're in a position. Mr. President, let me ask. Serious question. How do you stop that war in 24 hours? I know both. And frankly, uh, Zelensky was very good because, they, you know, he was part of the phone call. And he said he didn't say anything wrong to me. The Democrat, he could have gone in grandstand and said, well, I felt threatened. I felt threatened. He didn't. 
I get along with him. I get along with Putin. It's, it would have been much easier to stop it before it started. Putin would have never done this. Would have been much easier. Right now, it's a mess. Now they're hitting Kiev and they're hitting all sorts of things that weren't supposed to be hit. The country is being decimated. By the way, the deaths are far more than their report. You know, when they say nine apartment houses got knocked down and two people got hurt, they, no, no, hundreds of people died. The, the numbers are much different than what you're being told. Uh, I will get them into a room and they will, and I know an exact way. Number one, you tell one, you're not going to get anything unless you make a deal. You tell the other one, they're going to get a lot unless you make a deal. And you just sit them and you put them in, and you have to make a determination. And within, I'm telling you, within 24 hours, that whole thing will be settled. It'll be settled. And I have, and you need the power of the Oval Office. You do. You can't just walk in and say, oh, I'm going to settle the deal. You need the power of the presidency. It was a war that should have never, ever started. It's a horrible war. It's a vicious, vicious. I saw it today where missiles are going into cities, in this case, Kiev, and you see the school children going to school and missiles are following them. The whole thing is horrible. I will have that settled in 24 hours. People say, oh, you can't. It's just like when I hear the Sanctus, when I hear the Sanctimonious come and say, we need eight years. Again, if he needs eight years, don't vote for him. I'll have that. This country will be hopping in six months, and a lot of it's going to do with energy and energy costs. It'll be hopping in six months and less than six months, but it'll be, it'll be back. Thank you, Iowa for, Iowa, for being here. All right, unfortunately, Iowa and all of you all over the country, that's all the time we have left this evening. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Y'all hope you all had a good time. Anyway, from the great state of Iowa, now tomorrow night, we're taping more of the president taking questions from this great crowd. Have a great night. Thank you for joining us. More coming up tomorrow night.